Hi, my name is uh, Franz. Um, I'm an AI beginner. Um, so I'm not here to teach you anything. Uh, I don't know anything very much about AI. I'm here to ask some questions. I have some questions. I'm going to share them with you and hopefully get you to ask yourself those same kind of questions. That's really my objective for today. Um, so I think that the, the we are, we're looking at a revolution with AI, and I think it's the same kind of level of revolution that we had when we went from desktop software to web-based software. I think a lot of us are probably thinking, well, AI is sort of a bit, it's another tool, it sits around the edges. I don't think that's true. I think it's just as big a change as we saw back then. And I think all of you out here tonight, you're all of the kind of people who are always trying to learn how to do what you do better. Um, so it's easy to just double down on that. But I think there's a risk that if you just keep doing that, you're going to wake up one day and realizing you're really good at solving the wrong problem. Because I do think the problems we need to solve will change. So I'm going to run through a couple of scenarios, kind of thoughts, areas where you might want to be looking at AI or where that could potentially change your software, and then end up with a few thoughts on what I think is the best thing to do next. So the thing we most of us think about is this really boring, oh, I can do image classification, yay, or oh, I can do a bit of handwriting recognition. That's really cool for playing with AI, but it doesn't really tell you a lot about how you build business software, except sometimes you have users filling in forms and you have somebody looking at the form data and doing something with it. Like you might have people filling in a, an annual health survey and then a nurse or somebody looking at that and deciding who should be called in for an assessment. That's something you can use machine learning for. That's a classification problem. The key to remember there is that machine learning doesn't have to be correct. It always gives you a probability. So if you have something that can say, well, 90, I'm 90% sure that a nurse would have said this then that's okay. You can let the machine handle it in that scenario and kick the last, the last cases out to an actual human being. Those kind of things. And that you will probably find there's lots of in the applications you build if you start thinking about it like that. Another kind of problem is this concept of understanding what's normal. If you use Azure, you probably know Azure Application Insights. And what that does, it's a really good example of this, it monitors a whole bunch of stuff about your application. It automatically baselines it, so it knows how many errors are normal. You don't have to tell it. It knows what your response times are. You don't have to tell it. And if it changes, it will tell you. So that's great for a monitoring tool. Now, in your real world, if you have um, one of the things you know, a sign of, of impending mental illness or breakdowns is that people start working longer hours. So if you have time data, for, for example, in a system you work with, you might be able to baseline individual people's normal working patterns. And if they change, you might want to tell their manager they should have a chat with them. And maybe you can stop somebody from having a breakdown, for example. Or you might predict what's normal on the expense report and say, did you really mean to put 5,000 miles on that journey? Or was it, you know, because normally it's only 50 miles when you, you know, those kind of things. So there's lots of little things like that. You can pretend, you know, detecting what's normal um, or knowing what's normal. Then there's things like making suggestions. Um, so there's a silly little example, a very cool example, Google Draw. Anybody seen that before? So they made a little experiment. So you can go and draw things like that, like, and then it will detect that you probably meant a bicycle. And that's really cool. It's, they just did that as an experiment. But you will probably see this in action on your text message app on your phone. How many of you have that, you know, when you get a text message, it suggests a response? That's suggestions, that machi that's machine learning right there. That's how that works. Now, start thinking about where, do, where are your users going to start expecting that from your software? When, you're filling in a, when the user's filling in a form or doing something, when are they going to start expecting that, hang on a minute, I always do it this way. Why isn't it telling me whether I want to do it the same way? I've done it for the, every day for the last months kind of thing. So start, those kind of things, I think people are going to start to expect. They're becoming ubiquitous. They're everywhere just everywhere when you start looking for them. Then there's the bigger ones, things like intent-driven software. I think that's where the real future of this lies. This is a much harder problem to solve, and I don't think the tooling is there. So, you know, when you go to, so an example here, I got this from Crystal. So um, when you go online to try and book a holiday, it's one of the most stressful and horrific journeys in the world because you get like pages of tick boxes and you tick them all and it's like, no, don't do the 18 to 30 holiday because that means it's going to be noisy and, you know, Compare that to how it used to be. You'd go and talk to a travel agent and you'd say, I want to go somewhere. I can go skiing. I need, you know, some reds and some blues for my wife and the kids. And, and I need not too noisy and stuff like that. And there needs to be a reasonable travel distance. And they would come up with five or six suggestions. 
and you say, no, not that one, because, you know, that's too high up, I don't like that, or I don't like Italian food or whatever, and they automatically filter that. Now, I see software going in that direction. I see us getting to a point where you can replicate that in software. We're not there yet. I don't believe the tools are there yet, but you should start thinking about what data do you need to capture from your users to start building that future into your systems. Or even simpler, a more banal example is um, probably all of you shop on Amazon. So if you ever want to find out where's my t-shirt, it's like log in, click on my account, click on orders, list your orders, click on the thing, click on the tracking link. All I want to do is to go into Amazon and say, where's my t-shirt? That's intent-driven design. Now, I think that's going to come as well. I think we're going to start seeing things like that. And you might start thinking about in the software you design and build, you know, when are people going to start asking for that kind of functionality? And I mean, that's a lot harder to build, but I think that's where things are going, that direction. You've got to start thinking about that. Um, and then, of course, there's the whole category of changing the world kind of problems. There's a bunch of things out there that people haven't figured out how to solve yet that AI can solve, whole new businesses. There will be and there already are, and there will be new multi-billion dollar companies built out of this, this change. Just like there was when we moved to the web and the, and the sharing economy and all of those kind of things, new things open up. It's the same thing here. Now, I can't give you, an, give you an example of one of those, because if I could, I'd be out there doing it, not here talking to you, making some billions, you know. But again, that would be great. If you can find one of those unicorns, that's a really cool thing to do as well. Um, now, so what do you do next? So I thought about this. I started, because my job is to look out for new technology, so I started looking at that quite a while ago. And um, I started looking at, oh, I need to learn Python and Jupyter Notebooks. And I need to try and understand the math behind all of this stuff. And, you know, and that's really hard. Okay? And there's a reason that data scientists are paid a lot of money. So I actually realized there's, in my opinion, a better approach, which is four things. The first thing is actually not knowing how this works. The first thing is learning to identify where AI could be used in your, in your system. So that's really about going out and learning about finding use cases, finding examples of where people are actually using this stuff. So start training yourself to recognize it because that's the first thing. If you can recognize something in the software you already have or you're designing and building that could potentially benefit from AI, at least you have a chance to ask the question, should we do something with AI? Okay, like that form filling thing, because my default is, oh, I have a form that I'm going to fill in, I'm going to, somebody's going to look at it. My thing is, oh, I can hard code some rules for how to automatically process that thing. That's my default, because that's how my brain is wired. I need to relearn, I need to be a beginner, relearn to say, no, no, that's a machine learning problem. It's actually easier to give that to a machine learning algorithm, use the model builder, Matt, uh, sorry, Dan mentioned earlier, and just try and at least see if you can actually do some level of correlation, whether there is some, some sense in that data. So that's the first thing. Um, secondly, play with tools like ML.net, because apart from anything else, it's just great fun. You know, go and have a play with the toys, but don't try and become an expert. You don't need to be, not at this point. Just play with it, because it does build up your understanding when you sort of start understanding. It's all about probabilities, and it's all about numbers, and you start thinking, how does it, you know, how does it take a piece of text and do sentiment analysis? And that's really hard to get your head around until you start playing with it and, and seeing how the transforms work at, uh, in, on the wire. So it's helpful to build that understanding, in particular, learning what it can't do, okay? And that video Dan mentioned of the building a neural network from scratch, that is, was one of the most mind-blowing videos I've ever seen. It's, and that really clicked. That was something I'd never understood about AI, that that just made me, made me understand. Stuff like that, seek it out, play with it, learn the boundaries. Third, um, and this is, I think, really big. Um, I have found, whenever I've tried to look at a system I have and figure out how to use AI, I can't get usable data out. Because I might have a form that comes in, and I might have somebody looking at it and doing something with it. But I don't record that data as a snapshot. And in order to train a machine learning algorithm, you need this was the input, this was the output. That clear, that black and white. So start thinking about putting that into your system to record that data, so you at least have a chance of extracting it, analyzing it, and building a model. And that's what the biggest thing you can do today. And then finally, accept you're going to be a beginner again. You're going to be the guy who says, I don't know. I'm just learning. I'm new here. OK, and that's really hard because we're all really good at what we do. We've done it for a lot of years. But accept you're going to be a beginner. Thank you.